Hello, everybody, and welcome to another exciting edition of Next After Webinar Series. My name is Tim Kaczuriak, and I am very glad that you're here. Now, today's uh, webinar will be extra special. We've got a whole panel of wonderful people that you'll be introduced to as we go through our time here together. But before we get started, I want to start with a few housekeeping lessons, if my clicker will work. Um, Starting with a uh, question that is frequently asked, will there be a recording available? The answer to that question is yes. We will make a recording available that will be sent out at the end of the day today, along with links to any of the case studies or materials that we'll cover during today's conversation. Now, we want this to be interactive. We want to hear from you throughout the broadcast. And so please go to the Q&A panel and put in all of your questions. Uh, we will address as many of those as we have time to do so. Do not use the chat, use the Q&A. That'll make it easier for us to find them and answer them appropriately. As I mentioned, uh, today is extra special because we have a whole cadre. Is cadre, is that the word? I think it works. I think so. <laughs> of, of special guests that are gonna be sharing with you some of the research that we've conducted over 2020. Uh, and we're gonna start today off with Mr. Is it Mr. or is it Dr. now? You said you were working on something. <laughs> it's still Mr. Yeah. Do you wanna, do you wanna tell, is it? Now the time we tell them? No. Okay. Okay. Brady Josephson, he is the uh, managing director of the Next After Institute. Uh, Brady really drives a lot of the new research projects that we're conducting inside of uh, Next After's fundraising research lab. Um, and he's going to give us a little tour of some of the things you've been cooking up. So Brady. Yeah. Happy to. Thanks everyone for coming. So uh, at the Next After Institute, our mission is to decode what works in fundraising and make it access as accessible. I always trip over that. As accessible as we can to as many organizations as we can. And you're on here. We're talking about research. That's what we do. So I'm going to be talking about some of our more mystery donor type research, where we become a donor and a subscriber, and we track the experience to find gaps between what we see that works in our experiment library that Courtney, Jeff, Kevin, Greg, et cetera, are going to talk about. And then we find those gaps and then we create these resources, these webinars, these training materials, things like that. So in 2020, so last year, which seems like both the longest and shortest year of all time, but some of the things that we did on the mystery donor side is we actually looked at the online fundraising tactics of over a thousand organizations in nine different countries. Uh, we made 964 donations. We signed up for 554 emails and captured and cataloged that experience along the way. And then we tracked, analyzed, and classified over 3,000 different communications across email, phone, text, and direct mail just last year alone. So we're dealing with a lot of volume here around the user experience side of things. So we produced um, three of these research studies in this year, and I'll talk about one that's coming up uh, soon, next month. But I just wanted to pull out like one key insight and one kind of like thing maybe that, that you can take away and you can find all of those different studies for free uh, at various different places. So the first one is multi-channel. So uh, what we did is we made an online and an offline donation, $20 to the exact same organizations on the exact same day, which was actually pretty tricky to figure out. And then we saw how they communicated to us across four channels over four months. So one of the big key findings there was that the online or the offline donor was getting lost. In fact, two of the four organizations didn't send us anything. Mm -hmm. Two out of 10, nothing. Wow. Doesn't matter the channel, doesn't matter the type, absolute radio silence. We also saw a huge difference in volume from online to offline. But one of the things that we're trying to do in these uh, experiment or in these research studies is find examples, mm -hmm. things that are like interesting or cool or unique so that we can test them and kind of share them with y'all. And so one of the organizations that we saw do this well in terms of an offline kind of multi-channel approach was Buckner. So you can see kind of their communications chart and you can find the data yourself uh, looking at cultivation and uh, across mail and email. But what they did in this first like 50 days or so I thought was pretty interesting and unique. So they basically had this offline donor welcome series. I mean, we talk about online welcome series all the time. They basically took that principle and did it offline. So it started with a thank you receipt that came out after three weeks. Uh, they promised us that they're working to get that number down to less than three weeks, but mm -hmm. it was in the pandemic, so we'll let it go. And they had a, a reply device that actually like, would you give a second gift right on the thank you receipt? So it's kind of like our instant serial ask, but on the direct mail mm -hmm. side, something that I know uh, some direct mail folks have tested and see, saw that it worked. Two weeks after that, they sent this personalized, or at least it looks like it's personal. It could be from those fancy machines that I know you love. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you postcard from a donor relations person, just saying thanks again and had a little bit more information on the organization. 
that same week we received a impact postcard. And so now this had some cool personalization. So our donor's name was Paul. They merged that onto the postcard. And then on the back, they actually had a QR code. Remember those mm -hmm. bad boys? They're back again. Uh, where you could scan the QR code, go online and actually learn more and watch this person's particular story of impact. Um, a week later, they sent another impact postcard. This time was more about the organizational story, but same thing. They're using a cost-effective mail piece like a postcard to kind of engage and hopefully point you online to read more. And then two weeks after that, they sent an appeal. It was pretty mm -hmm. simple, straightforward, kind of basic broad appeal. QR code again, which take you to a mobile optimized donation page. And they used an open gift strategy on the reply device here, which is interesting. We've seen that work again sometimes uh, for high average gifts and really loyal donors. Mm -hmm. So they, they, you can see like the principles that we'll often discover, but they're applying them in the offline world. And then again, this is a multi-channel experience. So they sent five emails here, they sent two emails here, and they sent another five emails there. So over this time period, it's about 52 days altogether. Mm -hmm. The first 17 days got the receipt, and then all those communications came in the first 35 days, trying to really engage these new donors, both online and offline. So I thought it was a pretty cool uh, thing that they, they tried to do. And again, with tools like Virtuous and some others, you know, automating this type of thing is getting easier and easier, right? Sending automated postcards, automated emails, personalized postcards. So it's really something that people should explore, right? We've seen how valuable multi-channel donors are. So using that strategy is one thing that we saw stand out. I think it's interesting. So that was, you were just mapping the offline donors experience. And it's interesting that they inserted them into the digital stream of communications as well. They didn't actually keep them siloed in right. the channel that they came in, which is, you know, something that, you know, not every organization is doing, Brady, right? We found only 17% of organizations actually sent an email to their offline donor in those four months. Interesting. So this is definitely like an outlier. Well, and if, if we want to get donors to become multi-channel donors, which we know like retain at a higher rate, yep. they have higher annual value, and they're more valuable over the lifetime of the relationship, that's a pretty good strategy. Totally. Yeah, yeah that's the thing. How can someone give to you in multiple channels if you only communicate to them in one channel, right? right. So. There's, there's a lot more, check out the study. Uh, I thought that was kind of an interesting one. Then this other study that I wanna highlight, we looked specifically at higher ed. So we partnered with iDonate on this one and we made 109 donations of $20 and tracked emails uh, for 45 days. And uh, as you might imagine, if you've ever given to your alma mater or higher ed, the online giving experience wasn't great. Uh, when we compare it to other nonprofits that we benchmarked using the same methodology, it was, it was quite poor actually. <laughs> And one of the biggest reasons for, for that was required non-essential information. Higher eds were twice as likely to require non-essential information. Can you give an example of like what you mean by required non-essential information? Sure. Yeah. So essential information is the things that you need to actually process a gift. So for example, Mr. and Mrs. is one that we'll often see or title. You don't actually need to know whether they're a Mrs. or a Mrs. or a doctor to process the gift. But if you require it, that's not essential in every form field that you require you're at risk of having people abandoned. Okay. We've seen cases up to 50% drop for requiring things like a cell phone. So uh, tw higher eds were twice as likely to have those. And in particular, a couple of unique things with higher ed was fund designation, mm -hmm. something that a lot of organizations maybe have, but they don't require it. We saw higher eds require fund designation mm -hmm. at a much, much higher rate, mm -hmm. as well as this connection relationship. You know, Are you an alumni? What year did you go? Who are you connected to? And these are two extra decisions that people have to make. So increases, you know, decision friction. And so we saw some pretty egregious uh, examples of uh, fund designation. One uh, from the University of Alabama here, look at these drop downs. Mm. Drop down one, and then a sub drop down. I think there was only like 480 permutations. Cut me off a slice, yeah. <laughs> you know, and again, it's just a drop down and a long list, no context, nothing like that. Or something like this. Uh, uh, I included this university because I played baseball against them in college and made three errors in one inning. So this is my way to get revenge at them. Sick burn. Yes, yeah, nice. sick okay. burn. Uh, <laughs> so same thing, drop down, sub drop down. So many per permutations that you could do. So instead of kind of having these long lists and tons and tons of options, if you have fun designations, a few examples that we saw that we would probably more recommend. One is this from this community college. They just pre-selected, give to hmm. where it's needed most. If you want to choose or you're looking for a fund, great. You can click that drop down and now you can go. Hmm. But they've pre-selected one for you so you can just keep moving if you have no interest. Hmm. Or the University of Wisconsin here, they, they listed one, their most popular one. It's pre-selected. They gave two other options that are also more common. 
And then they had like all other options, right? Right. So they limited the decisions, pre-selected one, and you can still find all of those other ones if you must, but they're not making you go through that whole process. So question for you, I, I know that um, one of the things that I've always thought would be interesting is actually asking that question after somebody completes the gift saying, you know, just go through the process, complete your transaction. Don't worry, you can personalize your gifts yeah. like on the next step. Did you see any examples of that as you went through? One. One. Yeah. Okay, we cool. specifically looked for that because we knew this was going to be an issue. Mm -hmm. And we've talked about this before yeah. and I don't think we've actually tested it. I haven't seen examples. And there was one organization that had that where they actually said, thank you so much if you'd like you, they had some drop downs and then they had a big comments field that you could use as well. Right. So the rationale is it like actually moves that kind of cognitive friction to after the transaction has already been completed. So if then they get to that point, they're like, I really don't know what to choose. It's okay because you already got the money. Correct. Right. And, okay. and fund designation, whether it's like, how did you hear from us? All these other kind of like maybe interesting, non-essential things. Mm -hmm delaying it or having it on the, the opposite or after they get through the donation is one way to do Brilliant. it. Brilliant. So, you know, these organizations are using concepts like uh, status quo bias, so something mm. pre-selected, we're more likely to keep it pre-selected. Paradox of choice, there's too many choices we can just shut down or right. feel regret about the choice that we did make. Mm -hmm. And again, we've seen this in the research library. One example from Compassion International, where they have all these kids mm. that are available to sponsor. You can see on the left, rows and rows and rows of equally weighted kids versus on the right, they pre-selected one child. Mm -hmm. If you didn't want to sponsor that child, how dare you? But you can go down the rows and rows and choose other kids. Right. And by doing this, they saw a 48% increase in conversion, right? And we've right. seen this a few different times with compassion. It's well making the don making it easier for the donor to make a decision, right? Correct. Is what you're talking about. Right? Yeah. And okay. then within that, you can search by, you know, birthday and closer identity and these other types of things. But limiting and a pre-selection not only leads to the more likely that they'll choose, but not have regret, mm -hmm. right? If you had to choose of these three equally weighted kids, you might right. feel bad, did yeah. I choose the right one? That's a great point. Where if one's pre-selected, you may not feel the same number of regrets. So if you have fund designations or some other information, mm -hmm. are there ways to use pre-selections and limiting of options to reduce decision friction, or as you mentioned, delay it mm -hmm. until afterwards? A couple of things they could do there. All right, in this last study, we actually looked at public radio. So mm. same methodology for higher ed, but public radio. We did this with Greater Public. And one of the things that we saw, and we talk a lot about cultivation, mm -hmm. is public radio had a really high ratio of cultivation. Mm. So they sent 2.5 cultivation emails for every solicitation. And our general benchmark, when we've done this before, is more like one and a half. Give me an example of like what you mean by cultivation versus solicitation. Yeah. So, so. so we start with solicitation, which is the main purpose of this email mm -hmm. is to get money. Mm -hmm. Often it's a donation. It could be buying a ticket, but it's some financial transaction. And then cultivation is anything else. Okay. Newsletter, here's a blog post, your latest podcast, invite to a webinar, any of those types of things where the main intention is to do, get you to do something other than give money. Gotcha. So it's pretty simple, one or the other camp. And so they did a lot of high cultivation and we saw, you know, Chicago Public Radio, mm. like they'd send newsletters, they would send podcasts, they would have a news rundown, they would mm. have kind of exclusives for like you as a donor or a member, all these different content pieces, they're content factories, mm -hmm. right? So it makes sense that they're producing some of these. But when we looked at the design of these emails, we saw a lot of this stuff, right? <laughs> like animated GIFs and big hero buttons and huge hero images, lots of icons, a mm. lot of things that we've seen maybe, you know, aren't the best when it comes to fundraising and engagement. And so luckily the folks at KUOW in Seattle took us up on the option to test this within public radio themselves. Cause we said, Hey, is that adding value? Is this distracting? Right. What if you take it all out? So they ran this experiment. You can see on the left, they have the controlled email on the right. They took out all those design elements. Same text though, right? Exact same, text. same text. Okay. Right. Split their list in two here. And like, you know, NPR, KU, these are strong brand, you know, mm -hmm. that's, it's a big risk perhaps. And they took it out, ran the test. What was interesting, they saw an increase in clicks in the design version. Okay but they saw a 29% increase in conversions in the strip down. Hello. Which means the click to conversion rate was 79% higher on the treatment of the plane. Nice. And this is why it's important if you run these experiments, you run these tests, you can't just measure clicks mm. because often shorter, design, flashy, grabs their attention, they click, they see a donation page, and they're not even ready. So that, that's interesting to me that the design version got more clicks because one of the things that we typically find is that a more stripped down plain text version actually gets higher inboxing. Right. Um, but that, that data would suggest that that's not necessarily what happened here, um, but yet it's still yield, yield more donations. So interesting. Yeah. So I think just like the header image and the goals just kind of grabs your attention yeah. and then maybe you're we're wired to just click whereas on the right, you're often forced to engage with the copy. Mm -hmm. Why should you give, right? 
So it's kind of interesting. We've seen this now impact newsletters even, right? So just long newsletter full of content and icons and stripped it all out and actually just increased in engagement. So we're seeing this approach lead to better inboxing as well as clicks and conversions downstream. So pretty interesting. So then the question is, this is great cultivation, but what if they stripped all these emails down? You know, why do they need all these images and logos and things like that? Could they even get more, you know, engagement? So maybe that's something worth, worth testing and trying. Even for big branded organizations, can you get more engagement and more conversions by reducing and removing these design elements? So I think so. I would, I would venture. <laughs> I would venture so. So those are like the, the three main mystery donor research studies that we did this last year. And then um, the monster, the, the big beast. <laughs> We've been, we, this is like, we counted as 2020 because we did all these donations and we are still figuring out how to make sense of all this 97,000 data points. Hello. Before we even slice it up. But we, we did our mystery donor methodology in nine different countries, mm. 635 organizations. And next month, this will be live. So there's going to be some cool stuff with, you know, payment types and how different countries are focused on recurring or not and email volumes and things like that. It was really, really interesting. And so, you know, I'm going to be doing that this afternoon uh, to get ready, but that's what we have coming up next month. So those are just a few of the, the research studies that we wanted to highlight and some of the key things that we saw. That's awesome, Brady. Well, thank you so much um, for the, just kind of the potpourri of various <laughs> different <laughs> research studies that you worked on. Uh, the global fundraising scorecard, you, you've got multiple different languages that you're working through there. How, how did you overcome that challenge? That sounds like a, that was probably... Yeah, very problematic. Yeah. The, the first thing is we partner with other organizations in country. Very cool. Right? So mm -hmm. like, I know, je, je sais un petit peu de français, mais je ne sais pas ça. beaucoup. Yeah. Right? So I don't know enough French. I don't know Dutch, any of that. So we partner with agencies in the countries, mm -hmm. A, to not trip any flags on like giving with nice. foreign credit cards right. and addresses, right. cool. but also the they know the language so that they could read and be kind of our eyes and ears for the study. So worked with them and then we had to use different um, researchers to tag and score things on Mechanical Turk and Clickworker in different countries. And yeah, it's definitely been a process to figure out how do we take this into other countries and other languages. Well, I got a preview of some of the data and it's really interesting stuff. Lots of uh, fun things to start experimenting with. And I know that uh, we've already started. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, yeah. awesome. Well, thanks, Brady. Um, I think next up, we are going to invite next after is President Jeff Giddens. And before he comes up here, uh, I have a little Easter egg that I might be able to offer up uh, after to today's presentation for anybody that's interested. If you've ever seen the movie, was it uh, Internship with um, Owen Wilson and Vince Vaughn? There's a scene at the beginning where they're uh, in a convertible and they're singing Alanis Morissette. It's like rain. And so Jeff and I were on the Golden Gate Bridge in a convertible and we reenacted that. And I am gonna add that just as a little bonus uh, at the end of today's uh, presentation. So Jeff, why don't you come on up here? <laughs> now that I've given you that wonderful- The uh, real value yeah. add right there. <laughs> <laughs> really excited about everyone watching that, indeed. Awesome. Well, Jeff, you are gonna share with us um, some experiments that you've been performing inside the lab. So why don't you go ahead and set up the, the first experiment for us? Yeah. So. Um, as you know, we're always trying to um, figure out ways. I guess one of the one of the theses of our work and, and our experimentation is Did you say theses. Yeah, theses. 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 Like hypotheses. You know, okay. um, is that we believe that when we can uh, foster a closer relationship with the donor, right, mm -hmm. and break through that like fourth wall between the organization and the donor, and really try to create a relationship, which is especially difficult digitally, but is always digi uh, difficult from any through any medium that we can, um, you know, donors will give more, right? And um, language obviously is one of the key ways that you foster a relationship by how you talk. Um, and so we've been running um, experiments uh, along with our friends from the Institute of Sustainable Philanthropy over in uh, the UK. Um, we've been testing this concept around communal language. And one way to think about it is if you have like a spectrum of how you talk, communal language is on one side and transactional language is on the other. So communal language, Brady would be, uh, you know, me trying to trying to create common ground between us and talk about the things that we're doing together. And transactional language would be like, hey, I need you, I need something from you. You need something from me. Let's mm -hmm. transact back and forth. Hmm. So we were running this experiment uh, with an organization called Caring Bridge. They had a match that was going at the end of the year, mm -hmm. and um, they had this. Uh, it's a sticky bar that pops up at the bottom of their site. Mm -hmm. And there's a ton of tests about around this sticky bar in the research library, um, but they had determined, you know, that 
Um, big dollar amounts were really hard for people to kind of envision how their gift would make an impact. And so they had this counter that was counting down the donations they needed every hour. Um, but they had this language. Um, and we, sh we were looking at this language and trying to think how we could optimize it. And the language says, your donation will be matched dollar for dollar thanks to a $30,000 gift from the Caring Ridge Board of Directors. So what does this really do in the mind of the donor? First off, um, it, it's very transactional mm -hmm. when you kind of look at it through that filter. You know, and this is like a winning experiment. So this is this shows us how far we have to go, right? Mm -hmm. um, your donation will be matched. So it's kind of presuming they're going to make a donation. Dollar for dollar mm -hmm. is like talking about currency for some reason that people say that all the time. And, and matches are pretty common and we've tested them in the past. They and work, they're, effective, they're great. Right? Yeah. yeah, so it's not a bad thing. No, it also happen. kind of sets up the hero as the board of directors, mm -hmm. right? So it's like, thanks to our generous board of directors, they're gonna give $30,000. And there's like some legal language about why they have to do the $30,000 in there. Um, and uh, we said, hey, um, what if we actually just, like people go to Caring Bridge because they wanna stay connected with their friends mm -hmm. and loved ones who are going through tough health journeys or who they are, um, uh, far apart from and uh, especially uh, applicable in COVID. So we were like, hey, what if um, we just sort of thank them for being a good friend? Because that's why they're on Caring Bridge, trying to be a good friend. And like, um, so we came up with this treatment, it looks like this. It says, you've been such a great friend by staying connected through Caring Bridge. Hmm. Um, someone who is looking at this, they called it kissing the donor as soon as you see them. Like, just like tell them something really nice about them, hmm. you know? Um, if it's not too much to ask, would you consider giving today so that our board of directors can match your gift? And so what it does is it puts power in the donor's hands. Wow. Um, and it says, if it's not too much to ask, so like we're giving you an opt out before we've even asked. Right. Uh, but it honestly makes, it's one of those things that we hypothesize would make people lean in. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, would you consider giving? So not give, but think about giving, um, so that our, our board of directors can match your gift and almost taking the board of directors from like the people on you know, uh, in, in the high seat who are now like deigning you worthy of the gift to like, they're actually in service to you. Yeah. Like if you give, um, you know, they will match it. And what we saw was a 58% increase wow. in donations from people who click through that specific widget. It was completely statistically valid. Mm -hmm. And it shows like this powerful, um, uh, the, power, the power that language has, first of all, but also this powerful like way of talking. And we've run a lot of other tests like this and seeing sometimes you actually do need transactional language. Like if the person is ready to give, transactional language can help. Mm -hmm. um, but this was a big boost to this matching gift campaign at the end of the year. And um, I think the thing that we always love uh, experiments like this, because it feels like we can kind of break through something that nonprofits talk about all the time, you know, which is like donor centric fundraising, making the donor the hero, all of these things like, they're great concepts, you know, conferences talk about them all the time, but they're really hard to do, mm -hmm. especially when you're writing copy. It's hard as a marketer to stop being a marketer and to put yourself in the donor's shoes and say like, how can, how can we humbly approach the donor asking for support? We ran another test um, on a donation page that used some of the same language. Mm -hmm. And this is on a donation page, right? So this is not a pop-up in the site asking, this is, you've arrived here. Um, and the, the treatment, which we probably have 50 tests um, over the last five or six years on this page has this cause and effect language. So Caring Bridge, uh, kind of interesting because it's organization first, helps Kelly, your friends, stay connected to family and friends. You make Caring Bridge possible. So this organization does this, you make that happen, right? Is that kind of cause and effect language? And we tried a similar concept. Thank you for helping Kelly stay connected to family and friends because we realized something. By showing up, by commenting, by doing the things and engaging with the journals uh, on Caring Bridge, they're actually helping fulfill the mission, right? Right. So they don't have to give to do that. They're already doing it by being on the site and being a good friend. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, we said, uh, your gift to Caring Bridge will ensure that her private protected place uh, to share health updates is always here. And if it's not too much to ask, which I don't think that's a magic phrase, but that's one way of <laughs> taking the burden or the directness off of the ask. If you give today, our board of directors will match your gift up to $50,000. We had to put that on there because of legal things. I wanted to get the dollar amount out, um, but ran this test and saw um, an 11% lift in revenue on this page. You know, I think um, it was a, a it was 95% statistical level of confidence. I think that was rounding up. I think it was actually 94.5. Um, but um, obviously, I think there was a little bit of a smaller gap here because more people already were at the donation page. They had their mind made up, um, but uh, there's something about that um, acknowledgement that they're doing something good mm -hmm. because ultimately um, 
donors, it feels good to give, mm -hmm. right? And uh, we need to remind donors of that as they go through the process, mm -hmm. that they're doing something good. They're doing something noble by giving um, and that the, they're not buying a product. It's just different than you know shopping and transacting and right. all the other things you do online. So, so. so remind me, what, what's this technique called again that you used here? Yeah, this is called uh, communal language. Okay. And so it's this concept of, you know, on the spectrum of communal on one end and transactional on the other end, mm -hmm. trying to move at the right times our language more towards this communal language. And we're gonna um, develop some more resources around this because we've been running a lot of tests around communal language mm -hmm. in a lot of different places and we're learning a lot. And where in the world did you get such a interesting idea? Yeah, I mentioned we've been working with um, the Institute of Sustainable Philanthropy, uh, some folks out of Plymouth, uh, University of Plymouth in the UK. And um, many people might not know that name, but they know Jin Shang and Adrian Sargent who are the two principals of that group. And uh, we sponsored a research fellow um, there named Sarah Hendry, who's great. And we've been working with Sarah. And this is one of the kind of the psychological concepts. Um, they're very um, academic about it, um, kind of like theoretical. And we get to take that and apply it in the research lab um, to help really uncover like the impact and where it's best to use it. And it's been a tremendous partnership so far. Phil Psych. One, uh, one question I have. And if you guys have questions, please chat, chat them in. Not chat them in. Put them in the Q and A. Yeah, and we've we'll got a bunch. Sure that we get so. to them, but I think this is really interesting because in the past, this like the pre thank you right has always been something like, why are you thanking them? They haven't done anything yet, and it may reduce results. We've seen correct, experiments like and that. this like royal we like together we can. We've also seen that reduce results because it's it's like there's so many other people. So like there's these fine lines, right? So like, how would you suggest someone actually? If they're saying, I want to apply this, like what's maybe one of the safest ways or easiest ways for them to apply this? Is it that like if it's not too much to ask to soften or like, what do you think? Yeah, I think there are a couple of things going on here. I'm actually going to go back to the previous experiments. Um, I think the, the real way you can look for transactional language is look for language that actually talks about the gift and the giving process, mm. right? And amounts and suggestions and that, that sort of thing. You can circle them. Um, another thing we have a lot of research that's emerging on is uh, brand name mentions. Mm. And so I think some people would be shocked if you looked at a donation page, printed it out and highlighted every time you mentioned your organization's name, as opposed to flipping it and telling the donor what they can do, right? And some of this, uh, people who may be listening are like, yeah, we know, donor centric, whatever. Like, again, you might be shocked if you looked at the communications and looked at how much you know, the, the organization is mentioned and the power is not put in the donor's hands. Yeah. So I think that's the real shift is like, yes, we can do something together, but like you said, we can sometimes be a term that makes people feel like other folks are going to do the work, right? So we want to have that one-to-one -one relationship because you're only speaking to one person. Um, and so um, any, any chance you have, I think the mental model to run through is what chances do I have to speak directly to the donor and tell them what their gift will help do? Um, and if I can, try not to make it about the gift and try to make it about what their gift will help right. do. So. So, so in other words, like try to pretend that you're driving in a convertible with the top down across the Golden Gate Bridge, uh, listening to Alanis Morissette and singing at the top of your lungs with your donor, right? Basically, basically you want to put yourself in that car with your donor. Is that what you're saying? I don't think that's what I'm saying. <laughs> Wild editorialization. <laughs> All right, let me bang off a couple quick questions here. Um, is it possible, Ray, this is a question for you. Is it possible to know if your organization has participated in one of our mystery donor studies and see their own results measured against other organizations in the study? Yeah, if you email me, I'll tell you. Email Brady <laughs> and he will tell you, okay? Um, $50,000. And another quick question, the, 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 the Buckner offline process, was that new donors only? It was, we were a new donor, so it was a new donor. We were, us. we were a new donor. We didn't know. So when we do the mystery donor studies, we actually don't really know uh, how they're classifying us because we're on the other side of the wall. So we're just actually basically observing as a donor, but we were new donors to the organization through that study. Correct. Correct. Okay. Yes. Awesome. Awesome. Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. Let's see what else here. Well, is there, oh, here's a, here's, a, here's a question, Jeff, Jeff, for you. Uh, is there a way to find an email address for offline donors? How do you go about that? Not by appending, um, <laughs> which is what every data company in the world wants to sell you, unless you want a lot, a lot of bad email addresses. Um, the two most effective ways that we found to get uh, online contact information for offline people where all you have is their you know, name, home address, city, state, zip, are number one, to load them into Facebook and uh, target them with online offers. Um, you may get a 50 to 60% match rate depending on how much data you have, but that can be very effective. Another thing that we found is very effective um, is when you have an online offer, 
say a new resource or online course or something that people can come take is to put a postcard in the mail um, to your offline only donors and say, go to our website and register for this, send them straight to the offer page. Um, we've seen some groups, you know, get thousands of um, offline only donors to become offline with email donors uh, through tactics like that. You do have to lower the cost of entry. So like postcards are pretty cheap, pretty affordable. Um, but if you think about, yes, there will be a cost to uh, acquiring this email, but we know we'll make it up in the long run because our data points to it. And they're specifically choosing, right, to, he or to receive messages. That's correct, yeah. which is why it's different than in a pin. You're right. not choosing for them to start communicating with them. You are getting them to opt in, and that yeah. that momentum towards you makes all That's the difference. Great. Empower the donor, always a good strategy. I love it. Another like, super low-hanging fruit thing is we found that only a quarter of organizations even allowed for an email on a reply device in a direct mail appeal. Oh. Like, we looked specifically at about 50 direct mail appeals. Interesting. So a small sample, but it wasn't even an option. Wow. Right. Okay. So like, how can you accumulate emails if you're not even giving people the option to give it to you and when you do that put please print clearly yeah <laughs> the metric i've always wanted to know is how many emails are incorrectly right. entered into CRM. One, one one more quick question uh this is going back to that i think that buckner example that we we looked at is there a point where offline donors unsubscribe from the online communication because there's a lot of touch points it seems like the touch points are really high i mean this is a question we get asked all the time how much is too much um how would you answer that guys um, I think that that's, that's one way to approach it um, is like, um, yes, we, we may tend to overwhelm them, but I would say, I think what that question, and maybe it's just the phrasing of the question, not the intent of the question is kind of missing is like, what is the opportunity, right? Like by exposing people to all the stuff that we're doing that they may not get through the direct mail. Like I, I have seen the data has proven out the opportunity of doing that is always greater than the downside of some people opting out. Um, I tend to believe that unsubscribing is actually a helpful signal. I, I think it sometimes it seems like the worst thing in the world. You know, it's like um, you lose access to somebody or like that person, um, you know, is now shut off from you. But I think it's it's just a helpful signal. And I think people reserve the right to kind of prune and manicure their inboxes. And um, the the as the as the data in the multi-channel study shows, like the value. Um, not only that you can give to the donor of keeping them more informed about a cause they care about, but also the value they'll return to you in terms of additional giving is, um, is exponentially greater than, you know, what you might lose. Uh, because if they unsubscribe, guess what? They're back to being an offline only donor and they still mm -hmm. give to your organization. So yeah. through that, well, Jeff, thank you so much for sharing that uh, communal language. Uh, really looking forward to seeing some other experiments that you're working on related to that. And I'm sure the rest of the folks watching from their desk uh, would love to, uh, see that as well. So maybe come back and share some more. Will do. Thanks, guys. Awesome. Thanks, Jeff. Awesome. Well, we're going to keep it moving. This is rapid fire. So we've got next Greg Kalunga, who's our executive vice president. And Greg, you, uh, I don't even know what you're talking about. So maybe. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> Why don't you share that for an intro? So, uh, uh, yeah. You know, you know what's funny about that is neither do I. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> Freestyle. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, yeah, this is uh, this is pretty cool. So, um, you know, I mean, we were approached and asked to cut, to kind of go through uh, the library and look at experiments that were most impactful. I think this is one that um, is is uh, a lot of groups can can apply. Uh, I think everyone's doing it kind of like the control, and so there's a lot of opportunity. I think for folks out there. And Greg, and, correct me if I'm wrong, but you actually published more experiments in the library than basically anybody else in the entire company at this point, right? Is that, is that true? I think that's true. I don't know about most, but high quality. High quality. Sure. Oh, yeah. High yeah. quality. <laughs> yeah. Only the He's richest the mahogany <laughs> for my experiments. Yeah. Sing the <laughs> so so the, the whole concept here, Tim, is uh, it's borrowing a concept from like capital campaign mm -hmm. uh, methodology. And so, you know, I think uh, the concept here is is I call it a micro ask. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, uh, you know, capital campaign consultants will call it chartered standards. It's ultimately taking a big financial target and breaking it down into smaller bite-sized chunks that are really relevant for the audience. And so, you know, I call this experiment how uh, breaking your fundraising goal into smaller amounts mm -hmm. impacts your revenue. And oh. So like uh, public radio, like when they have like a goal for the certain hour, we're trying to reach X yeah, number. Yeah, exactly. Of, okay. gotcha. So, so what right. you would do is, in the case of, uh, in this experiment, it was for an organization that we work with, and um, they were running a campaign, and they had done a, a great job of kind of like mapping out why somebody should give, what the campaign was supposed to do, and you know, if you you 
remember the four elements of the value proposition are credibility, credibility, clarity, uh, appeal, and exclusivity. Um, the idea here is kind of like a mishmash of a bunch of different things. So mm -hmm. it's a little bit chart of standards, looking at what somebody's highest gift was, and then um, also going through and basically targeting an ask amount for them mm -hmm. that will stretch them a little bit, but also um, make it very clear how they can be a hero, essentially. And I think a lot of organizations, as they go through and write their campaign copy and their email appeals, they always kind of say, and, and Jeff even kind of mentioned it before, uh, for the Caring Bridge experiment, right? Like, would you give a gift? Would you make a special gift? Would you make a gift of any amount? If it's not too much ask. Right, if it's not too much to ask. <laughs> would, you, would you even just consider it? Right. And, the, and the whole idea here is most people write their campaign copy kind of like this, where it's like very open-ended, it's nebulous. It's really up to you as the donor to, to make the decision on what it is. But the, the idea for the chart of standards in the capital campaign is not just to break down the fundraising goal and figure out how many donors you need at each level. It's really to psychologically communicate and improve the clarity to the end donor. And donors really, whether they're a big donor or a small donor, what they want to know is that they can make a difference with their gift. They want to know that they're on one side of the chasm today and, they're, and that's potentially failure for the organization for the cause that they care mm -hmm. about so much and that on the other side is success and they want to know what the bridge looks like and they want to know if they can be the bridge between the two things right okay and so that psychological concept is basically making the donor the hero with their gifts you hear this a lot kind of in a macro sense you you know i think a lot of consultants you know if you've ever talked to one they probably say make the donor the hero with their giving like this is literally one way to, to improve the right. clarity and really give them an understanding so on the left here is the control which you can see in that first paragraph it's like you know will you consider giving a special gift to defend your principles and promote freedom and liberty for a generation when you do blah 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 right and so um what we did was we changed it ever so slightly. And what we did was we looked at the history, the highest gift that that donor had ever given to the organization. And then we stretched them a little bit, right? So if like they were a hundred dollar donor, maybe we asked for 250. And the other thing is we put in a specific number of donors. So you see it here, it's a $10 ask and it's 50 donors that were asking to make a $10 ask. So mm -hmm. this was going to non-donors. They were getting a small, easy gift. Mm -hmm. And we're looking for one, 50 people to step up and make chip in and make 10 bucks. Mm. Could you be one of those 50? The donor goes, you know what? Yeah, I could. That, that's yeah. an easy goal for me. But what we saw is on the other side of it, and, and the results were a 348% increase in revenue. Wow. And the reason why this was so much higher is that the higher end asks that were made, we, we, you know, the, the lower the dollar amount that we were asking for, the higher the number of donors that we were asking to right. give that. So amount. 50 for $10. Yeah, yeah, but on the other side, yeah. you know, we were looking two for, for two 5, donors who could yeah. step up and make a $2,500 gift, gotcha. right? Okay. Or, or five to make a thousand. And, and, we'll, and Greg, let me ask you a quick question. Yeah. Did you break down your email segmentation strategy as well so that you actually like sent to people that like have given gifts previously of amount similar to what you're asking? Yeah, so we took the whole file okay. and what we did is we split it in half. Right. And then, so there's donors donors and non-donors, hmm. right? And then on the half that we were going to run this experiment with, we looked at their HPC or their highest previous contribution. Mm -hmm. We put them into groups of like 50 or hundred dollar increments. And then we said, let's ask them for the high end amount of cool. this range, right? And so then we put in a dollar amount and we put a goal of the number of donors that we wanted to make uh, that gift amount into each contact record. So we had to create two custom fields. We had to do this work in Excel and then re-import it back into the system and then just use variable tags essentially to push the variables out, right? Um, and what ended up happening here was something pretty profound, something really cool. What we found was on the higher end amounts where we were asking for four donors to give or five donors to give $1,000, we had multiple instances where the donors that we were making those ask amounts to were actually saying, you know what? Not only will I do the thousand, all, you're telling me you need five at 1,000, which is 5,000. Mm -hmm. So I'll clear mine in everyone else because wow. I want to be the hero. Very we cool. had that happen multiple times across mm -hmm. multiple emails, which is why the revenue was so much higher. So it, it takes more time to do something like that. Obviously, right. it sounds like there's a lot of data manipulation you had to do first, and then to be able to set up and segment and send multiple different campaigns. But it looks like it's worth it. I mean, 348% increase in revenue is not right. nothing, right? No. Yeah, it's significant. Right. 
<laughs> so, and I mean, this was actually much higher. We kicked out a couple outlier gifts, yeah. which was, you know, even in excess of what we asked for in terms of donor quantity times donor amount. Right. So, um, you know, we, we feel like this was a little bit more realistic. The, the quadruple digit revenue increases, um, those ones always like make people go, really, is that, <laughs> yeah. is that possible? You know, where did you start at nothing and you got something? <laughs> Um, but in this case, I mean, for this organization, we actually ran three more campaigns for the year where this became the new control and everyone was getting asked like this. And when we compared it against previous year campaigns, guess what? It was about a 300% increase across right. those last three campaigns. You know, what's so cool is, is this is what's neat when you start doing more and more testing and you can kind of line things up with other theories because we know that like tangibility of just like very specific, whether it's dollar amount or impact, but this is also like 50 other people, like it's an achievable goal. I can wrap my mind around it. Yeah, and then also challenging donors. Right. Last year, we did a, an experiment with a couple of Harvard researchers who found that like, if you challenge donors to say, um, you can give a match to challenge others, that people would be more likely to respond or three other donors need to do this. I think sometimes we sell our donors short, sure. you know, like they yeah. want a challenge. Right? Yeah, they want to know that they can be, they can make a difference, right? And I think that that comes down to the clarity. Often we look mm. at the clarity of your value proposition, right. but sometimes like clarity and how the donor can really truly make a difference I think is also really important. Yeah, it's a good point. Quality guy. What a quality. That was, that was a quality. Rich, what a quality guy. Fine Corinthian leathers. Yes. Greg quality <laughs> Columbia. Well, you got something else for us or what? Uh, no, that's it. Okay. I mean, <laughs> no, I'm not. You want, well, you want, see you later. <laughs> any, any questions? I mean, it, I mean, you guys asked some great ones. Um, any from the field? Um, yes, there are questions. I think we're kind of getting caught up on questions here. Yeah, I think while, while you guys are looking through those, uh, the one the one thing that I'll mention here too, that's kind of a gotcha, I think for most organizations, or not most, but some organizations is, you've got to be able to, I mean, to, to basically pull off this illusion trick, right? I mean, they click the link to go to the donation page and on that donation page <laughs> might be a standard gift array, right? So there's some, some ways that you might need to basically segment the file. If you don't have the ability to push a custom amount through the clickable URL and dynamically populate that gift array, what you would do is you just create a donation page link for every bracket that you're pushing Obviously. people to. Yeah. And then, you know, <laughs> so you might have seven asked brackets. You would have seven different donation pages. Okay with those coded. I'm going to put you on the spot. Um, yes, sir. I, you called me in your office last week and you're walking through some new data that you're looking at. Yes, okay, so yeah. here's a question. So far, all this info is about online efforts. and That's great. You know, how do you compare the results of online efforts to historical offline efforts, especially cost items, you know, staff, et cetera? I, I, I don't know if we can, we can address like the staff cost kind of aspect of it because that sure. certainly varies by organization to organization. But can you just talk about the offline acquired versus online acquired and how that translates into like retention yeah, and sure. long-term value because I, I know that you- Yeah, I mean, there, there's, I mean, in that particular case, I mean, I think it's fair to mention um, that organization has a well-oiled machine in the direct mail program. Um, I mean, and, and they were just, they're killing it on the direct mail side. And they're trying to get their online program to be as effective or as productive as the direct mail program. And in that particular instance, when I was looking at that data, I was like all geeked up. I'm like, dude, you gotta look at this. And then uh, what we found was donors that were acquired in 2019 uh, into 2020, what happened to their channel? We call a channel cohort. Are they offline only? Are they offline with an email? So they're only giving offline, but they do have an email address. Are they multi-channel, which means they gave at least one gift in online and one gift offline, mm -hmm. or are they online only where they only give online, right? Um, and what we noticed was that um, digitally acquired donors for this organization in 2019, going into 2020, we looked at their migratory patterns across channel giving. And what we found was that two things. One, first, the donors that were acquired digitally in 2019, in the same year, 25% of them became multi-channel donors. Wow. And the multi-channel donor was 3.6 times more valuable than a single channel donor, either offline or online only, mm -hmm. right? And so they're three times more valuable and 25% of your multi-channel donors for this organization were coming from online acquired donors. And then when you bump that up against the, digital, the direct mail program, it was less than 1% of their mail or their multi-channel donors in the same year were, becoming, uh, were coming from the direct mail acquired donors. Hmm. So what does that mean? It means, you know, often it's, it's a lot more cost effective to acquire first time donor, but then secondary to that, the most valuable donor is somebody who gives at least once online, at least once offline in the course of the fiscal year, but this organization three times more valuable wow. than a single channel donor. 
And 25% of them were coming from, or went to, digitally acquired, went to multi-channel, which means their value exploded versus less than 1% of their direct mail donors acquired in the same period of time were able to do that. So those are a lot of numbers really, really quick. And so I'm yeah. actually going to put you on the spot again and ask you to write a blog post around that so we can share that. Yeah, with sure. Folks, sure. I think that that's yeah, really I think, I mean, the other thing, the other thing, I mean, if that's too complicated and it's hard to find, you know, the, the, the last thing that I'll mention here too, yeah, I'm getting the hook, <laughs> the big cartoon hooks about to bring me up the stage. The, the, the last thing here is retention offline acquired donors, the retention level for this organization, remember, this was a well-oiled machine, extremely effective. 68% of their uh, offline acquired donors were churning into lapse donors, whereas less than 45% uh, of the online acquired donors were churning year over year. So better retention, better likelihood to go to the most valuable segment, which is online and offline multi-channel donors. Better retention, better yeah. re revenue, Papa John's. Oh, Papa John's, Papa John's, yeah. <laughs> thanks, just, thank you, Thanks, Greg. guys, appreciate thank it. Thank you, awesome. Well, we're just gonna keep it rolling. I know a lot of this is fast. Again, there's a recording, so we will send this out afterwards, and Greg's gonna write a wonderful blog post. Uh, that's awesome. Uh, to explain some of the stuff that we've seen around the multi-channel migration patterns. But I am so happy because now Courtney Gaines is joining us, and Courtney is uh, amazing. I mean, wow, just can I just say that you're you are amazing, um, you. and uh, in so many different ways. Um, so, Courtney, you've got some. You, you do lots of experiments. You yeah. work with a lot of our clients. High volume. Yeah. Yeah. High volume. <laughs> high volume. High volume. Quality good, good, good volume. Uh, real good. But yeah, how you said good was uh, judgmental. So we will okay. dispense dispense with the pleasantries, and we'll just go ahead and turn it right sure. over. Sure. All right. Cool. So. Um, I wanted to share an example uh, experiment that we did this year. We, we do a lot of testing on articles, mm. especially um, on websites that get high volumes of traffic. So you've got all of this traffic coming to your site. Surely we can convert some of, the, of them to donors. And normally, <laughs> you're right, true, <laughs> yes. And normally what we do is put a one-time you know, gift ask in place. And that's great. We, mm -hmm. you know, we see a, a, a decent uh, quantity of people convert. But we ask, you know, is that the best kind of donation ask to put in that place? And in fact, what if we presented a recurring gift ask? Hmm. Are people ready to make that commitment just by, you know, visiting articles on a page? So uh, we, we added this little slide up feature on the article pages. So once you got to the article, it would pop up on the bottom of your screen. Mm -hmm. And the one time ask was a $60 one time uh, suggestion. Okay. And then um, we developed this treatment um, that was a recurring gift ask. Hmm. And we thought, what if we take uh, the idea of a small gift amount, like $5, mm -hmm. $5 a month is $60, $60 a year. That's right. mm -hmm. So could we actually get more you know, recurring donors to come on board knowing that their lifetime value is so much greater than just a one-time $60 donor? Mm -hmm. So what happened was we saw a 34% decrease in donations. Burn. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, I think back all those things so, I said about you. I uh, hope <laughs> you guys can apply this and get a decrease in donations. No, that's not all, folks. Okay, okay, okay. There's more to the story. So, yes, while we saw, uh, you know, an initial decrease in the number of, of transactions made, mm -hmm. the impact on revenue, we actually saw a 75% increase in revenue. Hmm. And the reason is this. Our initial hook on the recurring gift ask was $5. Okay. But when they got to the donation page, the suggested gift amount was fifteen dollars. Hmm. And so, what you know, the the idea behind this is so we, five dollars was there. It was a gift array, and fifteen was was, was a, highlighted, was right? Highlighted. Okay, gotcha. And okay. you know, it's not like we just ha we take them to a donation page and don't communicate anything. You know, we're, we're uh, you know reaffirming what we just told them on the slide up. We're telling them what their gift can do, and then we make that suggestion of the fifteen dollars. So people made that initial, you know, micro decision to say, yeah, I could give $5 a month. Mm -hmm. But when they got to the donation page and we reaffirmed what the impact that they can have and made the suggestion of $15, people said, absolutely, I can do $15 because mm -hmm. I can reach more people, you know, with this, this thing. Mm -hmm. So um, what was really interesting, we were very concerned uh, with this experiment that we'd see a very large quantity of $5 recurring donors, mm -hmm. um, but only 20% of the, um, out of all of the donations came in at $5. Do you and, know how many 15 you got? Uh, I don't, yeah, higher. Our, our average gift was actually $19. Wow, so. okay. So that pre-selection. 
yes. again is really was working. the key. I mean, that and, was key. And, and just to be clear, this was not like a bait and switch. It wasn't like you were asking no. for five and then the only option they had was 15. No, 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 no. It was you asked for five and then when they clicked through and said, yes, I would like to give a recurring gift. They're presented with the gift array of which five is one of the options. Absolutely. But they were self-selecting a higher gift amount. Is what you're exactly. Talking. And <laughs> and we, you know, we told them that in the in the copy of the why, like the impact, your impact can be so much greater if you give even more, you know, a month. Mm -hmm. right. uh, you can still give five dollars. Like you said that you, you raised your hand and said, yeah, I could do that. Mm -hmm. But when you got to the page and realized that you can, you know, do even more with your gift every single month more people said, heck yes. That's really cool. So. And again, the difference in revenue, you saw fewer donations, but because of recurring donors, right? That's what caused it actually. Exactly, that 75% uh, increase in revenue was the revenue uh, annualized. And so, so you project 12 months of revenue Correct. for these types, yep. right? And often they'll be a monthly donor for longer than that. Exactly, yeah. Yep. 12 months, if people are wondering, like, how do you compare these yes. two? Yeah, yeah, great point. Yeah, 12 yeah. months. And every organization looks at that differently, but right. for this one, they did 12 months. Gotcha. Yeah. Great. Question. <laughs> I think you know. I think what's really cool is that we we rarely will do a recurring gift ask on, on these article pages because we assume people aren't ready to make that like kind of big commitment. Mm -hmm. um, and we're actually I'm testing the same principle right now with another organization and seeing the exact same trend. Hmm. You know what's really interesting again is I mean this is part of the value of doing like the global research. Yeah. Where like the United States and it came up in the data is really ahead in a lot of different ways volume personalization. Recurring is one that where we in the States are always way, way, way behind. Yeah. And what's interesting is you look at other countries who do this a lot more, but also when you look at trends like um, digital first time acquired recurring donors are growing like 100% year over year. Like consumers yeah. are a lot more open to this now than Absolutely. maybe. So even tests that we ran three years ago yeah. would be valid now, but maybe they weren't three years totally. ago. Totally. Right? And I think the principle behind this too, Brady, came from this idea that you see on like Wikipedia or right. you know some of these other you know, news organizations were like, for as little as one dollar right. a day, or could you chip in five bucks this month? That's actually the where that idea right, came right. from. And we're like, can we do that? Do our donors respond? And then the bigger question was, well, do we want five dollar donors? Right. Mm -hmm. And so that's why that whole idea of the fifteen dollars mm -hmm. um, came into play. And then finding out that only twenty percent were five dollar, yeah, it was fantastic. Awesome. Hmm. So was this a a pop up or a slide up or something? Yeah. On the, on the a slide up on okay. on the on the article page. So as you started scrolling, this kind of just came up from the bottom. So, the, so Grace asked a question. She says, "Are pop-ups impactful for donations?" Ask or are they annoying to potential donors? So, <laughs> it's a good, it's a great question. I think that that all comes with testing. Like, what is the best approach to to take? And of course, but they work. They just to be absolutely, clear, absolutely, they, they, they work. do work. They work. So we don't know how to measure the annoyance factor. Right. Um, well, we can, we can yeah. look at bounce rate and oh, things like that. And we okay. have, I mean, we've done that with mm -hmm. on article pages. Like, are we seeing an increase in people leaving, you know, these articles or not? Um, and I think that's where you kind of have to weigh <laughs> the pros and the cons of that. Um, your, your fundraising team is excited and your marketing and web team is hating it. <laughs> but that's the key, right? People just go like pop yeah. up. And we all think about the pop sure. up where you land on a website for the first time. And before you even read anything, mm -hmm. it smashes you. Right. In the this is, you've read content, yeah. you've engaged, you've scrolled, and then it like, it's somewhat in context, like huge mm -hmm. difference between yeah. those two forms of pop up. And also knowing like, we knew that the site traffic on this page was, had a, um, a lot of mobile traffic. Mm. And so a slide up feature is much more mobile friendly than awesome. some kind of pop up that takes up your entire screen. And it's hard to close. Right. On the donation page, um, was it restricted to monthly gifts or just pre-selected? So pre someone could opt out and still do a one-time Yeah, gift. it was pre-selected. So we did see you know, a few one-time gifts come through, but yeah. Awesome. Cool. Well, Courtney, thank you so much yeah, for coming on. That was really exciting to see that boost in revenue. We're gonna go ahead and welcome our next and final guest. Uh, Kevin Peters, who is our Chief Technology Officer here at Next After, and Kevin. Um, high volume and high quality, I'd say. That's, that's, I that's what it, I yeah. strive for. My he, he, is, he is the total package, folks. So Kevin, <laughs> we are uh, so grateful to have you here with us. What are you gonna talk to us about? Uh, talk to us about today. So, I can say that, nailed it. Um, Thank you. <laughs> well done. <laughs> So the uh, experiments I'm going to be talking to today actually started with a new client we had brought in last year. Okay. Um, it was actually the first campaign we had run for this client. We had okay. finished and it just come off what we do as a uh, introductory roadmap, mm -hmm. which is analysis of web data, uh, email data, donor data. And from it, one of our recommendations was the idea to uh, really increase the volume, the velocity, and the urgency of some of the asks. 
And so we started with one of their annual campaigns, similar to like what you'd see with a year-end campaign, mm -hmm. high urgency, driving towards a specific uh, goal, three email or what was it, seven emails over the course of about a week, week and a half. So a lot of urgency with mm -hmm. it. Because it was a new organization, we tested a lot of things that we often find work to get just the baseline out of the way. And so with this campaign, we did a couple of things that you see a lot of these in our webinars and everything else. One was we tested a templated email versus a plain text email. Mm -hmm. What we found was what we usually find is that the plain text was more read believable, made it feel like it was coming to a person, got better deliverability, under an 88% increase in donations. We also tested a countdown clock in the email itself. We've talked about this at year end. It's a way of drive urgency, remind them of the deadline. When we did that, 35% increase in revenue. So mm -hmm. these little baseline of we're pretty sure it's going to work, but you still got to try it. You still got to validate it based upon the audience. Well, the one thing that we tried on this one that was unique, not the one thing, one of the things we tried that was unique was we had a segmented email to, they had a very large pool of lapsed donors. And we had the idea that, and there's a premise that we had hear, heard for that some lapsed donors may not realize that they're lapsed. Hmm. They think of themselves as a donor, regardless of when they last yeah. gave the gift. Yeah, that's like our our term for them, but they might not see themselves yeah. that way. Interesting. Like, I, I don't remember that it was twelve months and ten days. Since yeah, I last especially gave you a if gift. it's like May, and then la like that's a weird date for mm -hmm. me to lapse. You know? Yeah. yeah. And so they don't view it that way. So what we did is we did a test where we segmented out and split the lapse donors in half. You can kind of see the emails, but all we changed was the first sentence of the email. Dear Mr. and Mrs. Lapse Donor. Yes, we literally filled it in there and said. <laughs> No, they yeah. didn't do that. No, of okay. course not. The control said, first, it's important that you know the impact of your giving. Since your last gift, so many people have reached dot, 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 dot. All right. Okay. And then we switched the treatment. And all we did was this. It started the same. First, it's so important that you know the impact of your giving. Since your last gift of X amount on this date, hmm. so many people have been reached with dot, dot, dot. Nifty. Nice use of data there. There guys. you go. Okay. Yeah. And what's, what's unique about this is after the words, we found there's a 58% increase wow. in lapsed reactivation. Mm. And it goes to reinforce exactly what we thought, our hypothesis that people didn't realize how long it had been since they gave it. Yeah, that's brilliant. Okay. And yeah, we've seen this in other experiments with similar clients. One, we have a membership-based organization. And we kept saying, become a member, renew your membership. People didn't know that they weren't a member anymore. Mm -hmm. They don't think of themselves as laps. They were thinking of themselves in terms of I'm a giver, so I'm great. I'm good right. to go. In good standing. Hmm. Interesting. And so subtle. And with, with a test like this, what's great about this is most email clients, every email client I can think of, you have the ability to pre-populate data. Yeah. Let's talk about that for one quick go second. Okay. Because I know that this is a big part of what you do every day is figuring out like the different ways to get data in and out of systems, right? So how did you do this from the email system? Like, how do you dynamically insert their last gift amount and the date of their last gift, like through the, your MailChimp? Like, how do, how do you do that? So an ideal world that's connected to your CRM, it populates, you have a column. Have you ever seen an ideal world? I, like, I think of one or two. Okay. Yeah, no, no, it's not, it's not very common. Right. Instead, what we'll often do is we'll create, like in a MailChimp, you can create custom columns. Okay. You can make it called last gift date, last gift amount. Mm -hmm. And for most people, it'll be blank. And then prior to the campaign, we pull a list from their CRM mm -hmm. of an email address, the date of their last gift, and mm -hmm. the amount of their last gift. Most CRMs have the ability to export that information pretty quickly. Okay. Then we can upload it into the system. Do you have to like, kind of like merge, purge that in Excel or something first? Or? Most email systems will take care of that for you. Okay, cool. Great. So you don't have to worry so about it. So it'll update it the record based off of the person's email address. That's the key, yep. right? Okay. Yep. Gotcha. The key is going to be unique between every email system out there. It uses, mm -hmm. for the most part, everyone. There's a handful that don't, but most use email as the key. Mm -hmm. So it'll update. It'll have that information in there. And then we can also use that list we uploaded as the target list for this email. Okay. That way, if someone doesn't have that information, they don't see a thanks to your last gift of blank. Literally blank. Right. Okay, cool. So other kinds of data that you use that same process for, like I'm assuming like, you know, whether they're a donor or non-donor or, you know, other, is there other kind of attributes you've tested or experimented with in the past? Um, we've done a lot with last gift. We've done like highest gift. Mm -hmm. um, what we can often do is depending on the donation platform, a lot of them nowadays have the ability to pass in an amount in the URL. With that amount in the URL, we can use that to make sure the gift array is asking for the right amount of an ask. 
I don't want to ask a $500 donor for a $50 gift. Right, right, right. Here's a question. Uh, is there concern around sending incorrect information for the, last gift, for the last gift details? I can talk. Due to something like a duplicate record that hasn't been cleaned. And would that cause attrition by like not looking um, as though it's right? You know, I mean, like, is that a, is that a risk? Data, obviously data hygiene is at risk. If you have two records that you don't know, John is also Jonathan in your database. It's possible. But I'll say it this way. One is you can dedupe the email. Now you may not get the most recent a gift depending on whether they were tagged correctly, but with a 58% increase in lapse reactivation, my personal opinion, it's worth the risk of somebody getting the wrong gift date. Because if it's upsetting, they usually reply back and it lets you have a one-to-one -one communication with them. Mm -hmm. it lets you adjust the record to clean up your data for the next time. And then two, it can give a positive feeling in them to know that they're being heard and they have someone on the other end that they can talk to. Gotcha. Um, I'm going to answer this question for Sue. She said, can you please send um, all the questions and answers when you send the recording uh, in Q&A sections? Just, it seems to be lagging a little bit. Yeah, we're just trying to keep up. There's like tons of questions yeah. flowing through. We're just trying to do our best to- so, Kevin, maybe right. one thing that it kind of came up throughout a, a few different um, like questions, and it's really like tech stack yeah. data. You know, people are like, oh, this sounds really cool, but I have insert crappy tool here, you know? <laughs> and the analogy that I was thinking, I mean, pick any, like you wanna get in shape or you wanna run a marathon, like you need to like maybe get a gym membership. You maybe need some workout clothes. You know, I think there's a lot of organizations who just aren't investing or don't see the value in being able to do some of this stuff. So if they're like, okay, what do I need to look at? What are some key ingredients maybe if they're looking at other tools or other solutions so they could do some of this kind of stuff? Good, great question. Thank you. Uh <laughs> And you're also very handsome. So you have, you have all these you. things going Full for you. Full package as well. Yeah, everything happening over there. <laughs> um, so what tools do we use? We get asked this. This is probably one of our more often asked questions in the contact form of like, what do you recommend using for this? What, and the answer is it always depends on what you're working with. Mm. I'm a big uh, advocate for getting the best tool for the job you're talking about, mm -hmm. which sometimes can mean you don't get the one platform that does everything because right. what that generally does is it does nothing well, right. mm. but it does a lot of things. So more of like a constellation type mm -hmm. of approach as it relates to technology stacks. So you're going to have like an email system, best in class. You're going to have the best in class you know, web analytics and CRM and whatever. Mm -hmm. Okay. That would that'd be what I'd advocate for. Now, there's some situations where you can get uh, ecosystem that does work well together because if you have one that does it well the next qualification i look for is does it play well with others right gotcha so if i have a crm that doesn't talk to any other system that makes it really hard to find a good system that'll work with it mm -hmm. so some of the tech systems though that i would prioritize your crm is going to be the most important system you have so obviously you need a crm that can do the things you need it to do if you're heavy direct mail shop that changes things and if you're heavy uh major donor fundraising group Right. So you got to pick the right system accordingly. Yeah. From there, especially in the digital world, I'd advocate that email is probably one of the second most important systems mm -hmm. that come into it. Now, Agreed. if you're a big event-based organization, obviously that may override that. But with email, generally what we're looking for is how many are you sending and what are you trying to do with it? Mm -hmm. You can get a great system. MailChimp does just mo about everything you need it to do for most organizations, unless you're getting pretty heavy into personalization. Unless you're trying to set, talk to this guy who you know when he last gave, what he gave to, and how he was engaging on your website. Mm -hmm. Then like HubSpots and Marketos and Pardots become more powerful. Gotcha. But with that, you get higher prices, so. Right. Well, Kevin, thank you so much. Uh, really appreciate, uh, I love describing what you do. I say Kevin does really cool things with data and tech. And by the way, I helped you solve a programming question that you're wrestling with, and I've never written a lick of code, so. It was very impressive well. yesterday. Yeah. All right, Brady, <laughs> <laughs> you were also very handsome and good at things you do. All right, that's enough. That's enough. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right, so uh, we're a little over time. Thank you so much for sticking around all your questions. We'll try to get to all of them either now or afterwards or in the chat, we'll do our best. But one thing for you coming up tomorrow, if you want, Nathan and myself are talking about donation pages all day. We're doing one of our certification workshops where you can uh, send us your examples, there'll be breakout discussions, and we're going to go through what our data and research suggests is an optimized main donation page, campaign donation page, instant donation page, and how you can go about doing it. So if you're interested in coming, we'd love to see you there. These workshops normally go for anywhere up to $450. We've done them. Tomorrow, we're just doing it for $99. We want to start the year off. $99? Are you, are you, are you crazy? Uh, you can find it nextafter.com slash workshop. So there's still time to register. We'd love to see you there. 
uh, thank you so much for coming. And I think, I think that's it for us today. So that's a wrap. That's a wrap.